Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the tutorial that's called Introduction to Risk Five Boot Flow. It's basically how you boot a Risk Five system, like how you boot Linux in a Risk Five system in different ways, uh, which are available upstream and completely open source. Here is my colleague Anoop and Alistair, who was here. So they also have a lot of contribution to it, and they're here to help you in case you are stuck in some steps. So this is not a traditional, as it is called tutorial, this is not a traditional presentation. So feel free to, and we have uh, demo tutorials between presentations. So feel free to stop us anytime, me or them. And then if you have any doubts, any problems or any issues, just talk to us. And any questions also just raise your hand and ask the questions. No hold back. So, just to give you a brief outline of today's uh, tutorial slash talk, whatever you can say. So I'll start with uh, standard boot flow, how it is, uh, what's the standard adopted in embedded boot flow, and how it is uh, currently in risk 5 And uh, from that, we'll move to risk 5 specific components. So in boot flow, I'll explain it further. There are a lot of open source project involved. And I'll specifically talk more about the risk five specific one so that you know how it is different from other architectures. And then we'll also continue the tutorials in between the talks. I'll conclude with what's the current status, where and where are we going in future. So before we start, uh, so just to get an view of the audience, uh, this tutorial requires you to have a Linux machine. So anybody like doesn't have a, I am assuming everybody has a Linux, like anybody doesn't have a Linux machine? So I guess everybody has one, okay, one, okay, two. Probably you should just try it at home. Uh, the slides are available on that uh, URL. I couldn't upload this to the Risk Five uh, Summit website, so if you want to go ahead and uh, try everything, it has to be a Linux or a VM in, on your Windows or Mac. That will do, but we need a Linux environment. And you can uh, download the slides from that uh, URL. And then the, each slide, there will be instructions in the slide as well. So I'll go along with you and uh, do those instructions and then uh, boot Linux every time uh, in the, every tutorial. But uh, if you want to try it, just go ahead and download it now. And then it will, you can see the slides and have the instructions at your hand. And as I said, we need a Linux machine. If you do not want to compile the source, that's fine. I have already pre-compiled binaries in a link that is provided in the presentation. If you want to uh, compile, I'm not letting, I'll, uh, I'm not saying to compile Linux and uh, build root with the root of a system, which would take longer, but at least uh, to get a feel of the build environment and everything, uh, I have the steps to compile the risk five specific components. If you do not want to do that as well, that's fine, I have the pre-compiled binaries in the uh, the link that is provided. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, as anybody who has compiled Linux before, oh, thank you, uh, it's okay. It's okay, I'll just do it. So anybody who has done uh, Linux compilation before on your Ubuntu machine, you need uh, those packages to be installed. So if you have never done it, compilation, this is a good step to do it because you will just be compiling uh, risk by specific things, but it will give you a feel of how do you compile Linux going forward. So if you have a Ubuntu machine, that's the steps to get uh, all the prereqs set up, and you'd probably want to download the slides and do it if you are, uh, if you are interested to compile it. Next, uh, getting started. Uh, so is anybody just wanted to know so that if nobody's doing actually, so I can skip the slide or we can go step by step. So is anybody actually downloading the slides and trying to do it? Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so the first step is to create, uh, go to whatever working directory and uh, create the summit demo directory. It can be any name, I just chose to do summit demo for the obvious reasons. Then uh, you need to do download the cross compiler tool chains from that link. And then the pre-built images are in that, uh, the next link, in the box link, that's the pre-built images. And then uh, you need to do the cloning, git clone open SBI and git clone U-boot. Uh, 
as it is says. So the reason I'm doing this first because uh, Git cloning will take some time. So depending on how much awesome wickedly Wi-Fi network is here, I'm not sure how much time it will take. So if it really doesn't take time, then we'll know that for sure it's a wickedly fast Wi-Fi network. So to just to give how it will look like, I have already downloaded this. Uh, I will already get cloned this. When you download the entire uh, link provided. So when you download, this will basically looks like, I'll just briefly go through the files. The Linux image, as it says, it's the pre-compiled Linux image. Uh, Linux rootfs, as it says, it's a pre-compiled rootfs image. OpenSPI is the project I asked you to download. And then uh, QMU, so yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is all the tutorials we'll be going through today is based on QMU. So it's easier for everybody to run the tutorials. And the other reason is the device that requires to boot your Linux costs 1000 bucks. So I do not have enough to give away 1000 bucks devices to all of you. And I'm assuming all of you didn't buy a 1000 bucks device, high five on list. So I have a couple of them, so I can't let everybody run those, so that's why. And QMU is awesome. You can do everything in QMU. That's big. And with this, since it's in QMU, we can try out multiple uh, type of boot flows easily. And then the last one is the uh, tool chain that you would be downloading from the other link. And then this is U-Boot. I'll go through what exactly OpenSPA, what exactly U-Boot in a further slide. Just wanted to set everything up first so that we do not uh, waste time later. So back in the slides. So uh, any issues still now? Anybody having any questions? Okay, you're good. Okay, now the talk part. So I'll split it between talk and tutorial. So I'll give you some brief time between the talk and tutorial. So you have uh, time to switch over. So what exactly uh, boot flow means or what the common boot flow basically stands for an embedded systems. So when you look at uh, any standard embedded systems, you pick up any ARM64 boards or any other boards, you'd see the first stage of boot flow. There is, it's always a multi-stage boot flow and every stage has a specific role that it's supposed to do. So the first stage is like ROM stage. So we call it ROM stage because it's being executed from uh, ROM and uh, it, uh, it mainly deals with the power on reset and uh, clock setup. And then the next stage would be a loader stage, which is also called as first stage bootloader uh, sometimes. And it all uh, deals with the DDI initialization and the uh, runtime and uh, loading the next stages, and the, which includes a runtime and the proper bootloader. And some of the examples of this stage is uh, what you know as BIOS or you put SPL, core boot. Uh, those are the some of the commonly used ones in different architectures. Like core boot is mainly used in Chromebook. Uh, U-boot uh, is used in mostly all other embedded systems and BIOS and UEFI, you know, it's used in x86. The next stage is runtime. So depending on the architecture, uh, runtime is a separate stage or also sometimes combined in UEFI. And runtime basically provides uh, it's run from the on-chip SRAM or DDR, and it provides all, all your security boot flow, security components in the boot flow, and it also give you any runtime services that operating system needs after it boots. So there is, you might have heard UFE boot services, which is before it boots, the, those are the boot services. Those are implemented, those are specific to UFE, and uh, runtime services are when you already booted, and that's when uh, you require your higher privilege mode to talk to the runtime. Your OS needs to talk to the higher privilege mode. That's what is called runtime. So an example would be ARM trusted firmware. Right. No. So depending, like ARM doesn't have a runtime, right? ARM 64 hasn't. So this, it's not a much. That's why I say it's sub, depending on the architecture. It's the thing. Uh, so this is just common. I'll come back. I'll come to the RISC-V specific or the ARM64 um, specific ones. Then there is a proper bootloader which has all rich capability of loading your uh, Linux kernel image from different media such as SD card, network, or any other media, 
and that is called actual bootloader. That's what you see as a grub, which is the real, uh, you see when you boot, you actually see the grub prompt and all previous stages basically are hidden behind it. And uh, U-boot is a good example for embedded boot flow, something as Grub or Linux boot or also which you use on a daily basis. And then finally it loads the OS. And it uh, OS being primarily Linux, but obviously FreeBSD and other, other NetBSD, other distros as well. Now, in ARM64, if you follow, so I'm spe be specific, this is specific to ARM64. ARM32 is a bit different. Specific to ARM64, it's follow similar uh, boot flow. You can use core boot or U boot SPL. And then as a runtime, the ARM trusted firmware is the project that provides the runtime services. And the next stage is U boot. And uh, obviously next is US, uh, OS. Keep in mind that the first is bootloader, which is U-boot SPL or core boot, basically loads both ATF and the U-boot images. And there is something called Falcon mode in U-boot. Uh, if you look for it, you will find it. This is uh, for a smaller embedded system where you need really fast boot. What you can is let uh, U-boot SPL boot the entire OS, uh, directly OS without worrying about anything. But uh, depending on what board and all, it may be supported on that board or not. Now coming back to risk five, so we try to follow the exact same boot flow model with, with only minimal risk five specific components. The reason for that is we do not want uh, anybody to go and learn a different boot flow from any other architecture they are already aware of. You know how to boot ARM64, you know how to boot x86, you should be able to boot uh, risk five in the same manner. There should not be any difference and it should be as boring as possible. So that's what we try to maintain it. So the this boot flow is specific to hardware. In QMU you can play around because QMU has the awesome facility of loading images, uh, multiple images. So it doesn't have to be this way in QMU, but for hardware, this is what current existing boot flow and that is completely open source. So the ROM stays here and uh, since Hi5 Unleashed is the only hardware that actually boot Linux apart from the Kendrite board, which is really like, it boots Linux, but it's uh, it's a no memory Linux, so you can't really do much anything with it. So for Hi5 only, this is the flow. So first stage, which is a ROM stage, is here called zero stage bootloader, which is, uh, as it says, it's run from the ROM. Then the next stage is called first stage bootloader. Both of them are uh, open source by Sci-Fi. Then the runtime, here it's called OpenSBI, and the bootloader is called U-Boot and eventually it loads Linux. As the red box says, the runtime here is provided by OpenSPI and that's the RISC-V only specific components, uh, RISC-V only specific project that pro provides the runtime services. And it allows you to, uh, it has different capabilities which I'll go through in future, uh, in the further slides. And it allows you to load, it can be U-boot or any other bootload, it doesn't matter. So every stage is independent and every stage can be replaced with something else except the runtime services. To answer your question, uh, for RISC-V we need the runtime services to boot Linux because we need to provide something called SBI, which will I'll cover in the next slide. Sorry? Yes. Communicated now, we are good. Uh, okay, sorry. So what my question was that uh, even generally in the ARM64, you know that the, if I boot a UFI EDK2, once a Linux boots, we take over the UFI memory actually, right? Yes. And in the Windows case, yes, uh, even in ARM64 Windows, you have a runtime services because they yes. need it. Yes. Uh, but in this case, it means that uh, since you are SBI dependent and when Linux will do a call back into the SBI, so yes. you need to have open SBI in the memory even after the Linux yes. boots. Okay. Yes. So I'll go through the details of the, how it is there and we have a preserved memory where open SBI continues to run and why we need this. Okay. So yeah. that may be a requirement, I would say, right? For yeah, example, for risk 5 it's a hard requirement for now. Okay, yeah, that's exactly what I want to understand. Yes. Because when I map this to a EDK2, that's probably my interest is, that means that that's a little bit different than what my current boot flow is for ARM64. Yeah, so I have an EDK2 slide, so yeah. I can go through the 
So you where exactly Open SBI how it fits in the EDK2 flow. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks. No, there is no hypervisor. So hypervisor comes into picture. So the question was, is there a hypervisor involved? So hypervisor comes into picture when you boot Linux. This is about booting the hardware or booting QMU and booting Linux. Once you boot Linux, you can do anything with it. Yeah, if you have a type one hypervisor, you can just- uh, then, then you don't need the SBI, open SBI, I guess. No, you still need the uh, SBI because uh, type one hypervisor is being run on the, if it is in the M mode, it will not, but if it is in the S mode, you will need. Uh, I'll go over it why it will need and why we need the SBI services. Okay, so to before going to the SBI flow, I'll just go over the history of the RISC V boot flow. How we uh, we are, when I say we, it's not Western Digital only. It's an entire community effort. Uh, folks from Andistech, folks from Sci-Fi. I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting a bunch of names, but. There's a lot of folks involved in this. So we play a component, uh, we play a role, but not the, all the way, it's not done by us, just wanted to put it out there. So the legacy boot flow, which was basically done uh, by Sci-5, uh, was called Berkeley Bootloader, which was released in last year, February. After that, Grub support was added pretty soon, but it was way ahead of their time because there was no EFI stuff, there was no way to, add different platforms in BBL, there is no way to separate Linux kernel image from your runtime services. So to avoid, to accommodate all those uh, issues, we came up with the OpenSBI project, which was released in January, and that really accelerated entire boot flow uh, development. So in the few span of, uh, in the few months, we had already U-Boot, U-Boot SMP support, U-Boot support for QMU, Unleashed, everything got added. And then eventually you got, we got U-Boot SPL support and then now there is EDK2 support as well. This is just to give you a, a timeline history. And I call this risk 5 man or RV man, but this is the best naming I could come up with and this is the best graphics I could come up with. So which tells a lot about my creative skills. So uh, I've talked enough about SBI. So let's see what exactly SBI is and why it is necessary for risk 5 so SBI is the super called uh, supervisor binary interface. So it's an interface uh, that supervisor needs to communicate through the privilege, higher privilege modes. So in risk five, we have super, uh, user mode, supervisor mode, and machine mode. Machine mode being the highest privilege mode. So some of the registers, some of the features that's only restricted to M mode. That's why the supervisor mode needs to make an call to M mode to make things work, which are basically called as runtime services. The few examples would be currently there is no way to program a timer directly from Linux. So you need a, the time comp register has to be accessed, uh, modified by the M mode. So that's why we need uh, an SPI call. Another uh, example would be a uh, TLB flushing. So when you do a memory fencing instruction and use your TLB flushing, that also has to be done by the uh, super M mode. So that's why you need an SBI call. So there's a few examples. If you want more details on SBI, you can go to risk five SBI doc and there's an entire specification and there are currently revisions going on to this. So you can take a look. So, uh, what the other purpose of having def define an SBI is to give you an uh, give you a common image that can run across platforms, and it also duplicates the reduce the duplication of code between different OSs, and it can provide you common implementations. As I said, uh, it's in the GitHub page, so you can take a, go and take a look. Now, what is Open SBI? Open SBI is the open source uh, project that implements the SBI, impl SBI specification. So we started as a, as a, refer as a reference, impl reference implementation, sorry. And uh, the whole idea is to have a common implementation, well-maintained common implementation licensed under BSD2 so that anybody can use it as they want. So we have a lot of features added over last year, like over this year, uh, over last six, seven months, which let any platform 
makes it very easy for new platform vendors to make support, uh, add support for OpenSPI and they get their runtime services without doing a lot of work. A uh, few of the main features uh, that I'll be discussing uh, in the next slides uh, makes it, uh, just to clarify, it's a runtime service provider. So it makes it very attractive to just add your platform support here and you already have generic implementations such as uh, your interrupt controllers, uh, your UART. So if you follow, you are following the standard interrupt controllers, you do not have to even write those drivers for the machine mode and it has already inbuilt in it. You can just reuse the platform code. He's only he's the one asking questions. So give the mic. So, yeah, I'll keep it maybe for a while. <laughs> uh, so do you? So you know that the SBI overhead is similar to what we have in ARM is like SMC call maybe. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's an and, call. So and every SMC track. call is a nightmare in my yep. view. <laughs> so because you need to jump the exception yes. levels, and that uh, increases the like kind of penalty yes, actually, yes, right? Yes. And yes. so and this is basically pretty much. Um, you are doing for timer interrupt maybe i guess yeah. i don't know Programming so configuration the yeah configuration and then same goes for the interrupt controller and so do you no, see some uh, sort of goes for the ipis IPI. ipis and the tlb flushing yeah yes. so ipis meaning one heart to the another heart yes. right uh, remote and, uh, IPIs. and the scheduler will do probably a lot of that. yeah a lot of ipis yes yes, yes. so uh, do you see a kind of when we scale up a RISC-V, let's say the higher end apps processor, Cortex-A kind of series higher end, then this will become a bigger issue because you will run into the penalties and yes. maybe your so performance. This is an issue we have discussed numerous times in the kernel mailing list. Okay. So we know that IPAs are a bottleneck, timer programming should not be there in this first place and then the uh, TLB flushing shouldn't be there done in this way. The reason it is there because there is no provision in ISS spec. So to have a timer programming, uh, you need to have an instruction that allows you to in the S mode. And the similar, uh, the interrupt, the timer basically is attached to your local interrupt controller. So that need we need to have a pro and same as IPI. So we need to have a provision for that local interrupt controller should be accessible and modified by the S mode. Once we have that, somebody designs it will try to get rid of it. In fact, that's how uh, if you go and take a look at the specification, we are currently defining the 0 0.2 specification that allows all these uh, ex uh, all these features to be uh, make it legacy so that in future we can easily migrate to a system where we do not need this. For TLB flushing, we need instructions that can uh, actually go and do the remote TLB flushing. So you wanted to add, want to add anything on it? Thanks. So uh, whatever he explained is mostly true for the IPI injection and uh, and the timer. Yes, IPI would be slower, of course, but the only thing right now it is saving is the amount of hardware there. So most of it's like low end uh, embedded use cases. But yeah, going forward, like for very high core count, high CPU count systems, you will definitely need some kind of direct hardware support for S mode to inject interrupt from one CPU to other. S uh, uh, the remote TLB flush is kind of a philosophical question. I think in the RISC-V community, most of the people believe that software remote TLB flushes are better compared to hardware instructions, uh, which is why, which is like quite different from what ARM64 does. Yeah, but I think Intel has a so software remote TLB flushes. So probably uh, uh, the will continue like the remote TLB flushes pro for a longer time, but we might see. Uh, S more directly injecting IPIs or some other mechanisms coming as defined as extensions in this file specific. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Going next, the key features uh, of OpenSPI. So how it is designed as in different layers. So we have like uh, SPI library, which implements only the runtime services. On top of that, there is a platform specific library, which implements all the platform specific components such as your uh, local interrupt controller, external interrupt controller, uh, serial UART. And then there is platform specific firmwares, which you can directly take and uh, as for your platform, you can just use it to boot. We'll, uh, in the tutorials, I'll show it how it is done for uh, QMU. So the other uh, additional features, we have support for RV32, 64-bit, we have support for hypervisor, and as we progress in SBI specification, we con continuously 
modify the spec, prove it, uh, prove the spec by adding it to the uh, OpenSPI. So currently we have uh, these platform supports. We have obviously High Five Unleashed, and Stack, Arian FPG SOC, and then also we have support for Kenrite and QMU. And recently, uh, it's not yet upstream. Uh, we have it working. We add it for the OmniExtend platform, where you have like two socket systems are connected by the OmniExtend uh, protocol. Okay, I'm done with the talk for now. So let's go to the tutorial and. Uh, start doing something, start hacking. So assumed everybody or anybody who is trying to do has already downloaded the links. Uh, if you need uh, to, if you want to compile to the first steps, which basically do tearing uh, and uh, extracting the toolchain folder, and then just you need to add the toolchain folder to the path so that uh, you can, you do not need to give uh, the Pre, uh, cross compile and arc specific environment variables every time you do any instructions. And uh, once you download it, uh, probably your permissions are not set for the QMU binary. So you need to do a ch mod uh, to make it executable and set the environment variable as it is. Any issues? Thing? Okay. So I'll show you now how to compile the instructions. So I have already have it here. Yep. Okay. So this is the alias I have. Just to clean the project, it's already clean. Now, if you are in this project. Uh, just to export arc risk 5 then we do export arc cross compile risk 5 64 linux is the tool chain that i pointed you to download that's from the bootlin if you have a different tool chain already installed you just need to use the correct prefix for the cross compile then we just jump to open spi folder and compile the open spi so if you look at uh, Yes, it's visible. Yeah. So if you look at the instructions, uh, it says make platform QMU word. That's how you compile for any platform. So for QMU is the platform, word is the machine type. If you go to sci-fi directory in OpenSPI, you will see different platforms. Similarly, if you go to Arian, then this is a different platform. So any platform is basically compiled like that. And then uh, there's a form. So there are different firmwares that I'll be explaining next, but just wanted to give you a uh, first hand uh, look, uh, a teaser to how it will boot. So for now, assume that uh, firmware payload is basically an payload to the OpenSPI. I'll explain what's the different kind of payloads. That's how we pointed to uh, the firmware payload path, and then it will generate a firmware binary that I can directly use in QMU. So it's compiling OpenSPI and it generated uh, the, you can see at the end, it generated the platform QMU word binaries, uh, firmware binaries for the QMU machine, QMU platform for word machine. Now it's time to execute the command. And you booted Linux. You can do root and let's see I just booted one but you can always use the SMP argument uh, to do the SMP boot so to going back if you see the arguments here it says uh, QMU system risk 564 which is QMU binary you give the machine machine type which is a word machine then there is you define how much memory you need uh, no graphic is there's no window popping up so everything is command line here is the main part where it says open spi uh, platform so it gives you the kernel option which is says open spi firmware payload and then you point out the root fs image yeah so that's what the basically the instruction says we point out the platform in the qmu command uh, while compiling and then we use the firmware payload for in 
QMU command line like this and we define the, we pass the root FS as an uh, drive argument to the QMU. And we are in, here. Yeah. So this is, uh, we booted, so the root FS here is used uh, build root. I have not uh, shared the source code, you can just download uh, from the build root and then use build root to generate the root FS or you can use busybox or any other thing, uh, any other distro to use it. Build root is just easier, so that's why I have said. Okay. So this is the first one, it's the simplest one where Linux used as a payload to open SPI and then it boots. As the, you remember the boot flow which I showed you. So if you think about the boot flow, there is no U-boot now. I directly loaded Linux into the, uh, in, as a payload to open SPI. Next uh, tutorial, we'll do the U-boot thing. Okay, so any issues still now? Anybody able to boot it? Any yay, no? Okay, good. No, I said uh, the current ones doesn't, uh, Mac has a different tool chain, so you need to do brew install and then install the tool chain. Yeah, if I have Q, Q EMU installed on Mac, so I should be able to do all these things on Mac. Huh? Just the tool chain is different. Okay. Yeah, you need to do the, I think I was looking sometime back, there has a brew install, you can do risk five tool or something. So you can do the same thing as long as you have the correct tool chain and you need to okay. compile. What I said is all the pre-compiled binaries are for Linux. So you need to Linux to use it. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first basic tutorial. That's basically we never. That's the simplest one, and probably we never also use this one because it's. I'll explain why. Uh, before that, so how do you add support? Uh, add support for new platforms to open SPI, it's pretty simple. What you need to define is to one structure as an struct SPI platform, and then you follow these steps, write your own make file. You can take example of the other platforms and then add that support to, for your platforms. And the nice thing about it, since the runtime service is also combined as a library, it doesn't have to be in, it does, you do not have to add your code to the S, open SPI project. You can take it as a library and then you can keep your platform support outside of open SPI sources as well. Okay. So coming back to the firmware payload that I showed you, these are the different type of firmwares open SPI generates. First is the firmware payload, which is, it takes the next stage, it can be U-boot or it can be Linux and it takes it as a payload to open SPI and combines, create a single firmware image that you can use it that I showed you just now. And the issues with it is you have a uh, image combined in the firmware. So if you want to replace the Linux kernel or replace the U-boot, whatever the next is, you need to recompile it again. So you probably don't want to do that. You booted Linux, you find a bug, and you want to f you fix it. F you fixed it, and then you just want to recompile Linux and then put the image. That's why the other methods are basically firmware jump and firmware dynamic, which lets uh, which doesn't require a Linux image to be part of the OpenSPA firmware. So firmware jump basically says a fixed address where you can load the image, uh, whatever the next stage and then OpenSPA knows that I need to jump there. Former dynamic is even, even cooler. Former dynamic, what it does is uh, the previous stage to OpenSPA, which would be you boot SPL or core boot or anything, any, whatever the first stage bootloader, just need, uh, should have the capability to load OpenSPA and the next stage. And uh, what it allows you that OpenSPA, it, it doesn't have to your, uh, you do not have to be a fixed address. So the previous stage can load it to any address and then pass that information to OpenSPI. Now OpenSPI knows that it can load, it can jump to that address because that's where the next stage is, uh, next stage uh, payload is there. 
So currently uBoot SPL and CoreBoot is using format dynamic and uh, for format jump, uh, format jump we use directly in the QMU because in QMU it's easier to load anything to any address. So it's much easier in uh, QMU for format jump. So SOC vendors may choose to directly use these formats once they add platform support or they can write their own format. So nothing in OpenSPI is mandatory except the runtime services which is mandatory as per the RISC V system. So it's up to you what you choose and how you choose to use OpenSPI. Now the next stage as I have shown you the Linux part, now the next stage is the U-boot. So U-boot is the usually used as a last stage bootloader for uh, embedded systems. So it's a uh, most common last stage bootloader I can say. It has a lot of support uh, for different ISAs, different peripherals. It can load images from network, file systems, removable devices and it has a lot of uh, command line argument I'll show you in the next one. And it allows a lot of customizations such as uh, uh, initially I told you Falcon boot which is a customization that allows you to do a very fast boot without a lot of stages. Similarly, U-Boot SPL, which is a, reduced, a redacted version of U-Boot that acts as a first stage bootloader. Now, coming back to, this is the second tutorial that lets you boot Linux and U-Boot. So, U-Boot, uh, from OpenSPI, you jump to U-Boot and then U-Boot basically loads Linux. So, since I am showing it in the QMU, uh, if you, if you notice, there is no former payload now. When I when you give QMU word directly, it direct only builds a uh, former jump and former dynamic. And for this example, I'm using former jump. So you can see here, uh, we point to former jump uh, L file, and here is in kernel argument we just put you would bin. There is, uh, and then we since it's QMU, we load a Linux image as a specific address which is an advantage of QMU. You can also do uh, define a device drive and load the image from like you can emulate MMC in QMU and then load it from that or you can load it from network. I was just lazy and then more instructions so I just wanted to skip that. But that's how in hardware uh, high five only list that's how we use it. And uh, you can also notice uh, the payload, there is no payload, so it's just the U-boot image that we are giving directly to QMU. Let's go back to the terminal again. I'll quit the session. I'll do a clean again so that we know what exactly we are doing. Okay, I'm back in the terminal. The same thing, first uh, we try to compile U-Boot. Yeah, so the first step is uh, go to U-Boot directory and use the def config for U-Boot and then um, compile. The next step is open SBI compile and then I'll do run it in QMU. This is the step I first mentioned. Uh, it will basically jump to, go to uBoot directory, do a def config so it can generate the config for S mode, uh, boot in uBoot and then it compiles. And then it, now it's compiling the uBoot. In the meantime, I can just copy the next instruction. While it is compiling, any questions till now? Any doubts, anything? Awesome. Yep, we are done. Now we can compile OpenSPI. So since I have not given any payload, it just uh, runs the, generates the former jump binaries. And then that's what we are going to use. And then it goes to U-Boot. So you see, first uh, the first tutorial you directly jump to Linux from OpenSPI. Now you jump to U-Boot, and this is the U-Boot prompt from OpenSPI. <coughs> there is no Linux; we have not loaded it. That's the next slide. Yep. 
So this is till now what we have done. So now you see the U boot prompt that I showed you in the terminal. Now the next step is to basically configure the command line arguments in U boot and then follow a few steps which is like uh, copy the device tree to a address that U boot understands and then boot Linux. So I'll just use these three instructions and then we can boot Linux from U boot prompt. So first step is basically I'm setting the boot args which lets Linux uh, give, which provides the command line to Linux kernel. Then just copying the device tree to a specific address that you boot understand. The last step is basically boot i which uh, allows a flat image to boot in U boot. So now you see it's it's the same Linux boot, but it's a different boot flow using U boot. Same thing. Now I booted with four. First one you saw with uh, no SMP argument. So it did not boot uh, multi cores. Now I booted with four cores. So, so you see proxy pew in four, four cores. Now we can close it, go back to the presentation. So that's what you see once I executed those instructions, you saw those uh, uh, Linux uh, booting after success, Linux booting successfully after I executed boot i. So next I'll go and explain the coolest part which is the dynamic firmware. Before that any question until now for the previous firmware, how we booted, anybody having issues? Yeah. Thank you. The previous demo for building open is SVI. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I understood that you can run Linux on top of open SVI. Yes. So, so what's the, the function of open SVI and U boot? In other words. Uh, yeah. So the first one I showed directly you booted Linux using open SVI. The last one I showed was booted U boot and then used Linux. So the difference is U boot is a last is bootloader and much richer fetch. So in QMU it really doesn't matter because you can play around with where you load but when you actually uh, load it from the device, if you load directly Linux in OpenSPI, it's combined as a single image. So every time you need to change kernel, you need to boot, recompile it again and again. With When you boot U boot, you can put it on your SD card partition or you can put it in the network. So you can just do a TFTP boot that's what, and then you can load Linux uh, without recompiling anything or without uh, recompiling OpenSPI completely. And you don't even need to recompile U boot. You just load it from network. Compile it, put it in the TFTP, and then boot it. I just didn't show you that because more instructions. Like, okay, let's get on with it. Okay, so now, uh, any other questions? Great. So now we move to explain uh, why, uh, what is dynamic format. I'm focusing more on this because that's how most of the recent development going on. So that's how most of the bootloaders, first stage bootloaders are actually making use of it. So to give you an example how it is being used is uh, first is bootloader gboot SPL or core boot. Both of them now supports, uh, both are supported in disk five. And what you do is you define a firmware dynamic infrastructure and you pass it via a register to OpenSPI when you load OpenSPI. At the same time, you load the next stage, which is, can be U-boot or it can be also Linux, it doesn't matter. For the sake of argument, we say it's U-boot. Load it to the memory. And then when you load it to the memory, you pass that memory address in that structure and then give it to OpenSPI. So OpenSPI now knows, doesn't need to know, it doesn't have to be a fixed address, it can be any address. Now OpenSPI knows that where to load it and then when it does all the initialization and when it try to jump to the next stage in the supervisor mode, it just jump to that address. 
So currently, uh, Uboot SPL support is available for QMU and Andes uh, board. Uh, for Hi5 Unleashed, Uboot sup SPL support is being added. And uh, Core Boot support already is present. Now, the last tutorial where I'll show how to use the firmware dynamic binary and how do you do it. So, it's the first instruction is the same thing. You do not, you just provide, there is no payload. You just say that I am compiling for KMU word machine and it will also generate the firmware dynamic along with the firmware jump, which I showed you the last time. Next, you need to compile uboot SPL apart from the uboot proper. So, first we'll uh, do this again open SBI uh, and then we'll go and do the uboot SPL compile it and then we run it in QMU. So one uh, critical uh, information that you need to observe is first you need to compile OpenSPI and then point the format dynamic to U-boot, U-boot SPL. That's how it knows where to, uh, that's how it has the capability to load OpenSPI into memory. Because now U-boot SPL, then there is OpenSPI, then there is U-boot. All these OpenSP and U-Boot are combined and then uh, formed as one image and then that's all those information U-Boot SPL knows how to load it to the memory. Once these are loaded, U-Boot proper is loaded without any, any, any of your interaction uh, or you do not need to recompile it every time. You just need to recompile Linux, reboot Linux when you fix a bug. If you want U-Boot also, like you are a U-Boot developer, you are compiling U-Boot again and again, you probably just want to keep it OpenSPI uh, and load you boot from an SD card or network which you would SPL supports. Now let's get on with the tutorial and do it. Okay. So tutorial three instructions. Uh, I have already you would uh, compiled open SPI, so we don't need to bother with that. The next is I'm compiling you boot SPL with exporting open SPI as a path so that it knows where the open SPI path is and it can include in the image. Next, I'll do the same def config we did last time for reboot compilation, but this time I'll use the SPL def config. Next, I'll do compile uboot as the last time it will take a few minutes. So what it generates, I'll show you what it generates. It generates a U-boot image and it also generates and use the format dynamic to generate and combine fit image and then uses the fit image, loads into the memory and then uh, jumps to open SPI and passes the information where the U-boot proper is that into the format dynamic infrastructure. We are almost done. Any questions that I can answer? Either I'm really doing an amazing job or everybody's asleep. So that's why I had one hour presentation. It's really, really long. Somewhere I read like human attention span is probably like 30 to 35 minutes. Because I knew in grad class, the class was like anything beyond 45 minutes. I was like, oh, I don't want to go to the class with one hour, 30, one hour, 15 minutes. So 75 minutes is like way too long. So anyways, it's what it is. So it's uh, now it, uh, we are compiled. You can see at the end, it uh, generates the uboot.itb and uh, which is the uh, fit image. And now it's time to run Linux boot Linux. Before that, I'll just focus one second on the arguments. So if you look at the argument, I pointed out in now, instead of uboot.bin, we pass kernel uboot.itb, which is a fit image combined, uh, which is a combination of OpenSP and uboot proper. Then there is, uh, instead of BIOS, where you used to pass the OpenSPI, now we are passing uboot SPL. So that becomes the first stage bootloader. Then there is a kernel, uh, in kernel argument, we pass it a fit image, which becomes uh, the next is, which is OpenSP and U-boot and from a dynamic loads those two and specific memory addresses, which is defined by 
uh, that and then uh, we also loaded Linux image to a specific address because can you can. In real world, you would probably want to load it from MMC or network. So I'll execute those instructions again. Yep. So as, as I explained before, I'm still uh, again in the U-boot prompt because it booted into U-boot now and we need to again execute some commands to boot Linux. Yeah, so you can see I'm at the U-boot prompt as I shown you before. Now I need to execute these commands, which would let me boot in the boot into Linux. forgot to copy paste. Oops. in the prompt so so I'm just now copy pasting one by one so first I copied the Linux kernel image uh, to that QMU loaded to a specific address to the address you boot understands now I as it is the last time I am doing a setting the command line arguments now I'm copying the device tree now the last command same as last time boot i and then it boot linux same boot same image everything same but you see different ways and advantage and disadvantages of each boot flow now same thing we see this time i didn't use the smp argument so yes because uh, since it's use it uh, if, if you notice yeah, you do not see OpenSBI logo because when a OpenSBI image is combined as a uh, former image into, oh, sorry, one flat image, fit image, and given to the U-boot, it's, uh, there is an option, OpenSBI has a lot of configurability, so there is an option which lets you disable the boot prints, and U-boot SP didn't want to say that we are booting OpenSBI because they wanted to be transparent, so they use that option to disable it. So that's why you do not see the OpenSPA prompt here compared to the previous time. So yeah, that's the last tutorial I have and still have four minutes. So I can still go through a few slides and make you more bore. Yep. Yes, I like questions, so I don't have to go through slides. Thank you. I just was holding on that. <laughs> uh, so. Again, just a couple of suggestions. I think your default binary doesn't work for me for QMU on the trusty. Maybe I'm, I need to still upgrade to U-boot to 16, but I'm running into libusb problems, looks like. Uh, but anyway, that's minor. Uh, maybe you want to keep a static binary of QMU. Mm -hmm. uh, so the second part is that, suppose I want to use OpenSBI and EDK2, let's say. And now EDK2 yes, is a different package and OpenSBI, uh, the I'm library. I'm coming to that, this is the slide. Yeah, maybe let me finish. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of uses, so uh, meaning if I want to use Open SBI source code as is instead of writing from the scratch, right? So then I need to add a package into uh, the EDK two because yes. everything is a package yes. model, yes. right? So and then uh, that will be one release, and then I need to keep syncing from the upstream project, which is Open SBI for me. So you guys plan to do uh, kind of. Uh, one release which is going to be adopted by EDK2 or it will be always that if someone wants to use OpenSBI, just take a release from here and keep syncing as a sub module or whatever trickery you want to do. But then, because then there will be always something yeah, like yeah, out yeah. of date, you know? Yep. So uh, we have like uh, every releases, like every few months. Currently we are at 0 0.5. So currently the EDK2 port that's in the mailing list, 
they have chosen to split the open spi like uh, the library they keeping in the what was the package name i forgot the edk2 package name so they separating the platform into the edk2 platform code and uh, spi library to what is the, do you remember the package name you can okay. take a look at yeah. the whole point, idea was to i think they are planning to sync it to the every release okay so the and that's what current plan is, but it's not yet most. So feel free to go and comment on the mailing list, and if you have a better idea, to no, do I'm it. just looking at when she starts uh, be using that as a real project, and then there would be a regulars because we are doing a lot of updates on day to day basis, yes, right? Of course, that has uh, to happen. So because it's been an external project, being an upstream project for EDK yes. two, I still need to make sure that it's being synced by upstream or when I'm yes. doing developments. So if there is a formal release method yes, by we, EDK two upstream developers, that okay, we will keep syncing. Uh, on some regular cadence, then that would be really useful. Then I just need to sync EDK2 into my project development. You don't yes. have to worry about open so SBI. As sync. far as I know, and as my discussion with Abner, I think that was the plan, but it might be changed. Like, I do not know what's their syncing schedule with open SBI. Is it open SBI release or open SBI like a month to month? I don't know. So you probably better ask, should ask yeah. that question in the uh, mailing yeah, list. Yeah, I'm going to ask him yep. actually. Yeah, okay, okay. great, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so I have one minute, so I can finish two slides. So, yeah, okay, good question. I don't have to finish the slides. Um, first question, uh, do you know if this is the boot sequence or, or the bootloader sequence that uh, Sci-Fi is using? And second question is, uh, is this what you guys are using for your hypervisor development efforts? Yes, hypervisor we are using, we are not using open, uh, EU boot. But uh, from OpenSPI, you use and mostly it's in based in KMU. So how you do see uh, it booted Linux directly. So if it is a type one, we boot type one directly instead of Linux, like use that as a payload. Or if it is uh, a type two like KVM in hypervisor, we basically boot Linux and then KVM runs inside Linux. So we boot guest from Linux using KVM tool. But yeah, this is the flow except the e-boot part. But uh, all hypervisor features are added to the OpenSPI. So OpenSPI is mandatory for uh, hypervisor. And for coming to sci fi uh, depending, so since uh, there was a legacy port uh, by sci fi which was uh, called BBL, which was similar to runtime services, but it have little uh, restrictions on how to add platforms and all. But sci fi is the, sci fi has their own platform, so at, and which is supported by BBL. So depending on whom you talk to sci fi some of them use BBL, some of them use OpenSPI because it's similar implementation. It's just that it doesn't have support for other platforms. So it only supports Sci-Fi's platform and of course QMU. Okay, so yeah, these are the oh yeah, more questions. Awesome. So uh, thank you. It was a great talk. Thank you. Um, one question is if you want to have a, if you want to sign the image for security purpose, at which layer do you sign it at every layer? And how does that? So um, we get, are not uh, there in terms of se Just secure. Just make sure that I'm not, somebody is not basically hacking into the system and trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So image. there is currently discussions going on how entire secure boot will come up. There is a work group in the Risky Foundation in the called as T group. So they're still in decide, deciding what to do, like where to steps and all. If I would do, we can do it in the open SPI, but I'm not sure whether that will be the recommended one or that will be the mandatory one, how they will proceed. So it's still in flux and not yet decided. So there is no secure boot for now. Okay, so I'm 0 0.00, so I'm time, time. So the, all the, the remaining slides are there. So I do not want to make you hungry. I know it's lunch time. So I'll just skip those. You can go through them and at your own time, at your own pace. And if you have any questions, you can shoot us email. You can contact us anytime. And I had a cool slide. Yes, I spent five minutes to make this meme. So I hope it didn't make you sleep. Any questions, we are here, we are around. So you can ask us. And the slides will be uploaded in the website, so you can always take a look about the future, current status, future work, and how EDK2 uses. I mostly answered everything through his questions, but there's a slide more details, so you can take a look at it. Thank you.